So we have the honor today of having Dr. David Adelson. Dr. David Adelson is a well-known pediatric neurosurgeon. He is director of Barrow Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital, Diana Bruce Hall and Dow Chair for Pediatric Neurosciences and the Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Adelson is going to share his lecture, The Evolution of Pediatric Brain Injury and Neurocritical Care. Please type your questions on the Q&A section. We will read them after the end of Dr. Adelson's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Adelson, and thank you. It's all yours. somehow I'm um, muted here. There we go. Yeah, yeah. It's truly an honor to be here and uh, to lead off this uh, international web-based uh, Congress. Uh, uh, truly a great lineup uh, is seen throughout the agenda. If you have a chance to take a look at it uh, over the next two and a half days, uh, really truly amazing work by the organizers. And I congratulate them uh, on uh, putting together this uh, really very uh, uh, really needed uh, Congress, uh, especially since uh, with the crisis, so many meetings have been uh, canceled or, or delayed. And uh, so again, thank you for the honor of, uh, of being here. Um, today, I'm gonna speak to you about the evolution of pediatric uh, traumatic brain injury, but with a really wanting you to take a a more global approach or a more global appreciation that while I'm going to focus on traumatic brain injury as being uh, my example, one can really start to look at this as an evolution in our understanding of, of the brain after it is injured. And there's a lot of different definitions for injury, um, as well as what I see as the evolution of neurocritical care going forward in the future. Uh, I think that this is an exciting uh, time for uh, traumatic brain injury, but also for neurocritical care. And I think it brings together a true multidisciplinary team in order to best treat these patients, you know, at a very acute and very critical time. Um, I think for those of you out there, we'll see that this is really uh, an evolution uh, and one that's we're still at the beginning of our understanding and uh, truly, this is going to have a major impact over the next couple of decades. Uh, I have no particular disclosures, but I want to start with that, uh, you know, trauma, and, and this is where I got, uh, you know, very interested in, in the field, was that uh, trauma, and particularly traumatic brain injury, uh, remains the leading cause of uh, death and disability in children uh, in the United States, as well as around the world. Um, the numbers are astounding when one compares it to other disease or disorders like uh, brain tumors or leukemia or uh, even infectious diseases. The reality is, is that when we look at the mortality from trauma, particularly traumatic brain injury in the United States, it still remains greater than all other pediatric diseases combined. And that's what's really truly amazing about this. Unfortunately, most of our, what I would call our understanding of management is really comes from only single institution series. There are a few clinical trials uh, that have been done, a few cohorts, but uh, the reality is, is that because we don't have a lot of research and science in this area, uh, this has generated very few unique drugs or therapies in order to improve outcome. And this is not just about traumatic brain injury, as, as, I, as I am alluding to, but issues of things like stroke or status epilepticus or other types of, uh, of brain injuries. Um, the reality is, is that we, we know that uh, the brain itself is a very complex organ. And so uh, trauma to the brain remains that of a very complex disease. And it's complicated by multiple levels of differences. Uh, the reality is, as I mentioned, is that practice today has depended on really single institution um, uh, studies and very minimal parameters by which we measure how a patient is doing. Our outcomes have also been uh, very limited. 
Uh, we have very global functional outcomes, but that's about it. And so to really understand something such as the brain and particularly a complex disease like traumatic brain injury, uh, I believe that new uh, strategies uh, have to be developed uh, in this area. Well, let me use as an example, and I'm gonna rib uh, Dr. Sinai, who will be speaking with you a little bit later. This is a slide that uh, he, he uh, uh, gave me, uh, but this was 1980 when um, I was in medical school and this was our sort of glioblastoma survival. And then uh, we went forward with uh, 30 years plus, uh, now up close to 40 years plus of, of uh, research uh, in this area and uh, you know our our glioblastoma survival uh, now uh, if is is this and so if we were to sort of overlay these two areas, we really haven't increased survival from something as GBM and we've poured millions if not billions of dollars into research for uh, cancer and brain cancer in order to try to move the needle what looks to be very minimal. In contrast, if we look at traumatic brain injury in children and we start to look at uh, early series, what we see is that survival in traumatic brain injury was around the 70 to 75% back in the 1980s. And despite the fact that there's been very little research in the area, you can see that we've been able to, through a number of different um, uh, approaches to really increase the survival after severe traumatic brain injury. So what I'd like you to take away from my talk today and, and also our question and answer is that the reality is that aggressive early evidence-based protocols uh, in the basis of neurocritical care does lower morbidity and mortality in the injured brain. And I put injured in quotes because the, the reality is, is that it's not just about traumatic brain injury. We need to look at how the brain gets insulted on a daily basis in order for us to now more broaden our perspective and broaden our appreciation of what's going on. Present day therapy is truly directed at the avoidance of what I'll call second insults. And there are a number of different terms that I'll go over as well as lessening the secondary injury. Our therapies in the future um, will be uh, based on the fact that we can identify and treat acute or ongoing brain injury. And then what I think is exciting and what will really be our future is the ability to restore and regenerate in order to improve the function in the patients once we get the final outcome. So with that, I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about our challenges when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, traumatic brain injury. May, many of you may have seen this slide from Jeff Manley. This, are, this is a patient who, uh, these are a series of patients who have a Glasgow Coma score of four and would be considered severe traumatic brain injury. But the reality is, is can we really consider um, the epidural hematoma as being the same as a DAI? And so is traumatic brain injury truly one disease? And I would argue that it's not. And similarly, if we were to put up pictures of patients with stroke or ischemia or um, uh, patients who've been in status for 72 hours, their brains are gonna look completely different. And yet we use something like the Glasgow Coma Score as an assessment of that. And then if we throw in the variable of age, and now we start to look at something like uh, this, which is a, another, as a child who suffered non-accidental trauma, that we even magnify these challenges even that much more. And so while I'm gonna be focused, since I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, focused on uh, children, uh, the reality is, is that these changes occur over the spectrums of our lives. And so the reality is that our challenges are numerous. There are challenges at the front end, which is how do we assess uh, the injury? And so classically, we've gotten neurologic exams, pupillary exam, those kinds of things. We've used the Glasgow Coma Score, uh, but is that really the optimal way that we should be categorizing uh, an extent of a brain injury? 
Um, we don't do the same for, let's say, a, a brain tumor. We have some diagnostic measures. So we do use imaging, so CAT scan. Um, in some instances, individuals use MRI in order to um, uh, do an initial assessment. But the reality is, is, is that enough? And there's been a lot of um, literature now in, in the use of biomarkers to assess brain injury. But how much of those measures are giving us the ability to uh, prognosticate or be able to predict what's going to go on with that brain? Not only long term, but also what is going to go on with that brain in the next hour or the next 12 hours or 24 hours or over the next couple of days. And so that's really where our challenges come. We also deal with many differences in management. So uh, if you're doing a, a drug trial for a brain tumor, um, there's very, very defined measures by which uh, the tumor is removed, the residual tumor, the drug and when it's given, and then the measures of outcome in order to determine whether that drug has uh, made some improvements in that patient. Um, that's different in traumatic brain injury. And so because we have very few tools to assess the brain at any given time of what's going on neurophysiologically, we're often left with very differences in management. And as a result also, we don't have very good outcome measures. We have very global measures like the GOS, Glasgow Outcome Score or Glasgow Outcome Score Extended, or even the Glasgow Outcome Score Extended for PEDS but there are lots of different outcome measures that are out there. And, and while many of them have been what we would call validated, do they give us really a good picture of the, of the uh, injured and then recovered brain? So I'm just gonna touch a little bit on the individual differences using age as, a, as my example. Uh, we know that there are age-related differences in the neurobiology. We know that the aging brain from uh, early uh, childhood to now to more geriatric brain changes in its neurobiology. As a result, there's age-related differences to injury. So whether it be the mechanisms, we don't see shaken baby in teenagers. Um, though uh, I have a teenager, there are times I'd like to shake them. Um, we do know that there are differences in the primary mechanisms, that we know that there are differences in their response to second insults. And then we also know there, there are age-related differences in the pathobiology, so the secondary mechanisms uh, of injury. We also know that there are age-related differences in treatment, so different ages, so that we know that there's sensitivity and vulnerability to different drugs at different ages. So we know, for example, that you can have a, a contrary result from one drug in a child as compared to an adult. So while one drug may be sedate, uh, uh, sedative in one patient population, it may be excitatory in another. And so we now need to look at not just pediatric approaches to treatment, but adult approaches to treatment and older adult approaches to treatment. And so that really begs the difference of how do we individualize our management of these patients? And then lastly, we know that there's age-related differences in the way the brain recovers and repairs itself. And so we need to take into account these differences in age and maturity and plasticity when we start to develop unique aspects or unique uh, uh, therapies for these different ages. And so we have to have different approaches for different age patients. So just to go over again, neural injury, and, and again, this is not just about traumatic brain injury, uh, but all types of injury that we may encounter. The definition with regards to the primary mechanism is that the etiologic cause of the injury, uh, the primary injury is as a direct result of that mechanical force uh, or ischemia from at the time of the trauma or at the time of the injury from the primary mechanism. A secondary mechanism is the pathophysiologic response. So that primary injury and that mechanical perturbation will set off a cascade of events that then leads to what's called the secondary mechanism. The secondary injury is as a direct result of those secondary mechanisms. What I like to call a second insult, some people call it a secondary insult, 
is an additional injury on top of the initial primary injury that then leads in part to increased secondary mechanisms and secondary injury. Let me show this to you uh, diagrammatically. Here's the brain. If we have the um, uh, impact, so if you have a trauma or if you were to have a surgical injury or a stroke, this is the uh, uh, primary mechanism on the injury. This then leads to um, what we call the primary injury uh, to the brain. This then leads to the cascade of events that then occur as the secondary mechanisms. And there's a number of them as I've, I've listed a few of them here. Uh, this then leads to the secondary injury. If we now add insult to injury, this then worsens those secondary mechanisms. And then this then leads to worsened secondary injury. So ultimately, the, there are different types of second or secondary insults. Something like we know that hypoxia and hypotension right after the uh, primary injury in the field will lead to worsened outcome. Uh, we know that, for example, you could have a, uh, the primary impact could result in a skull fracture with a tear of the middle meningeal artery. That tear in the middle meningeal artery is the primary uh, injury. Um, the hematoma, the epidural hematoma that occurs afterward is that second insult. So as that uh, hematoma expands, it's now adding further injury to already what may have been a concussed brain. Now we're leading to a, a worsened injury. And there's a number of other second insults as well. The secondary mechanisms, as I mentioned, are these different pathophysiologic events, and there's a number of them. These are just even just a small example of all the different mechanisms that occur in that secondary injury phase. So when it comes to um, uh, secondary mechanisms, we also have to recognize that that creates a potential cycle of events and so that you can continue to get secondary injury with secondary mechanisms. These are worsened insults. And then this becomes that cascade of events that unfortunately we often see, which is um, really catastrophic uh, cerebral edema and um, intracranial hypertension and eventually brain death. So how does this all play into our management? Well, ultimately there are three ways for us to protect the brain. Um, and to give us the best outcomes long-term. Uh, the first is obviously injury prevention and mitigation. So um, wearing helmets when we are, are biking, um, obviously seatbelts in cars. So if we can prevent the injury from occurring, that is going to obviously mitigate the, uh, the brain injury. We do have some evidence-based clinical and surgical uh, treatments, which I'll talk about as well, and rehabilitation strategies. So ultimately, using my diagram here, if we're able to uh, prevent the uh, injury or, or lessen the impact uh, to the brain, uh, if we're able to prevent some of the secondary mechanisms, uh, or if we're to avoid those second insults, so avoid hypotension and hypoxia, hopefully we then uh, eliminate or lessen the uh, secondary mechanisms and then um, uh, lessen the uh, secondary injury. And so some of those medical management and surgical management we've seen really have come from uh, the guidelines, uh, uh, at least the pediatric guidelines have been out there now for uh, now 17 years. Um, what we've been able to do is, I believe, is really as a nice companion to the adult guidelines, identify the literature and, and how it may be unique and uh, different uh, in the pediatric population. Um, again, the third edition was released uh, just a year ago, um, and I would recommend if you have the opportunity and the interest to uh, seek out uh, those uh, guidelines that are available online, um, uh, really open access uh, to be able to uh, see where the literature is with regards to traumatic brain injury in children. So what do we know um, about the management of TBI? Well, as I mentioned, we have some supportive care um, by the adult and pediatric guidelines, which really ultimately are about the avoidance of second insults. So avoiding hypoxia, hypotension, those kinds of things. We have some treatments for intracranial hypertension, 
but those are really once the brain has already started to swell. And so what we're doing is we're doing therapy in response to already a uh, secondary injury phase. And then we've got some surgical interventions in select cases. Some of these are to avoid second insults, so evacuate that epidural hematoma in time to prevent um, uh, secondary mechanisms from occurring, or in response to secondary injury. In those patients, you know, a decompressive craniectomy, for example, we utilize in order to uh, try to give more room for the swelling brain and to try to prevent um, further damage um, to the underlying tissue. So let's talk a little bit about where our therapies exist. And I'll, I'll first start with ICP and CPP, intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure. The reality is that present day therapy is ICP directed. And I know there's a lot of controversy out there and there's a lot of discussion. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about ICP as we go forward. Uh, but I guess the question comes down to, you know, should I place an ICP monitor? And this is a wonderful quote that I I've gotten from a colleague of mine, Pat Kohanek, um, that treating traumatic brain injury in the present day uh, without knowing the ICP is like treating diabetes without knowing the serum glucose. Now, is intracranial pressure monitoring the be all and end all? Absolutely not. Is it indicated in every single patient? Likely not. But at this point in time, this is really our mainstay when it comes to uh, monitoring and understanding what's going on with the brain in real time. Uh, as many of you know, uh, there's also the use of cerebral perfusion pressure management, and that's the use of uh, CPP, cerebral perfusion, which is a calculated number of mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So simple management, if we're gonna maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, we either have to avoid hypotension by maintaining or pushing mean arterial pressure, or we need to minimize the intracranial pressure or minimize intracranial hypertension. So the question about using an ICP monitor or not, again, there are lots of questions that remain. And I would be the first one to say that there's a lot that we don't know. The questions that you always have to ask is what information does it or will it provide in this particular patient and will it be particularly useful? That really begs to my earlier comments, which who optimally should get it, which is what, what injuries or what situations or what indicators tell us that this is the best patient who would benefit from having an intracranial pressure monitor. It's not just, just about traumatic brain injury. Uh, we had a patient here with a PCOM aneurysm who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and developed swelling 72 hours after um, a surgery. In that patient, we placed an ICP monitor. And again, it told us the extent of how non-compliant that brain was um, relative. And this was a patient who did well then with a decompressive craniectomy. So again, we need to understand what our ICP monitor is measuring. And then how do we put that in sort of the global look of our understanding of what we're trying to uh, appreciate. And then ultimately, what is gonna be the outcome uh, when it comes to saying whether an ICP monitor was useful or not for that particular patient? Well, there's a lot of different numbers that have been bandied about. Um, these are um, not hard and fast. The, um, if we look at the literature, the reality is, is that ICPs of, um, uh, 15 to 22 in adults are considered normal. We sort of use a range of 20 to 25. But when it comes to infants and children, we may need to consider that lower ICPs would be at the upper limits of, of uh, normal for them. Adolescents really in the adult range. And similarly with cerebral perfusion pressure, we have to recognize that a, a, an infant does not have a mean arterial pressure of 60 to 70. And so um, we have to consider potential for lower CPPs when considering uh, management for these patients. And so when it comes to management, uh, there are the guidelines. And so these are really pathways that you can look up um, through the pediatric guidelines. Um, we have some baseline care and some general maneuvers. 
And these are some of the recommendations that you'll see there. So I'm going to uh, breeze over these a little bit, but there is also the ICP and CPP pathway. And again, I would recommend the ability to review these. Um, there is an algorithm that we put together um, for these different pathways. So there's a surgical pathway as indicated. There's an ICP CPP pathway as indicated, as well as a herniation pathway and also a use of brain oxygen pathway. And so these are very, um, what I would consider uh, helpful tools uh, for us uh, with regards to putting together a critical care uh, management uh, of these particular uh, parameters for these particular patients. Uh, here's an example of the uh, first tier pathway and uh, first tier um, therapies for patients. And you can see uh, the baseline care here seen at the top and the different pathways for herniation, uh, for ICP, for brain oxygenation, as well as for salvo perfusion pressure. These all then lead to second tier therapy. And uh, again, there's um, a path, series of pathways for a second tier treatment uh, in these patients um, and uh, all of the different measures uh, that you one would consider um, in these patients. I'd like to highlight that there was a recommendation for the consideration of advanced neuromonitoring and, um, and the use of uh, um, uh, uh, surgical intervention uh, when indicated. And again, here's the second tier um, uh, treatment pathways uh, that one would see in the, uh, in the latest edition of the uh, guidelines. And again, I would recommend uh, seeking those out for um, uh, further interest and guidance, uh, particularly when uh, managing uh, complex patients uh, in the neuro ICU. So now I'd like to, in, in the rest of my talk, talk about sort of uh, the future approaches to neurocritical care. And again, I, I, I applaud uh, Jeff Manley, who's really been at the forefront of this area. Um, this is a slide I, I borrowed from him. This is the cardiac care unit, and you can see all the different parameters that we utilize in the cardiac care unit, probably even more so now, and we have a multitude of drugs in which to, to uh, change the way that the physiology of the heart uh, at any given time. We've got, uh, we've got cardiac physiology, we've got imaging, we've got parameters. In the neuro ICU, uh, we've got MAP and ICP that gives us CPP and that's about it. And as a result, we only have about four drugs at the present time. And so the reality is, is that our neurologic monitoring, in, in my opinion, and I think the growing trend is that it's really quite limited. There is a lot of available monitoring. So this is our, what I would argue is our standard right now. But what you're going to be seeing and what you may have already seen is that advanced neuromonitoring is growing. And there are a multitude of new monitors that have already been out there for many, many years, but unfortunately there's been very, very low utilization. And so the questions come up as to what would be better ways for us to integrate these into our present day management. So the reality is, is as I already mentioned, is to create an environment of neuro recovery. So the patient that suffered a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, is that we really do need to understand what's going on physiologically in the injured brain in real time. And so we have to be able to measure when there's second insults going on. We have to know when there's secondary mechanisms of injury because our management is gonna be geared towards preventing those insults, preventing those injuries so that we can optimize the outcome for those patients, but also give us learned um, understanding of what type of interventions would be best for those insults? If it's to avoid hypoxia, we've got a simple measure about turning up the oxygen, unless the lungs are not exchanging well. And then we've got to come up with other therapies to prevent that hypoxia from occurring. And so we have to be able to measure not just the capability to measure those responses, but we also have to be able to measure those responses to our treatments to see if our treatments are working or not. And so this is the present day, what I would argue is the present day approach to neurocritical care. And so this is a multimodal approach and you can see here's the injured child. Uh, 
Uh, they've got, um, they've had a decompressive craniectomy. They've got brain oxygen monitoring. They've got uh, transcranial Doppler here. We've got temperature control. We've got EEG here. We've got um, a, a monitor in order that consolidates all of that information. Uh, so indeed in this child, we've got all of the, the necessary equipment in order to try to understand what's going on physiologically in this child at any given moment. And so um, in this day and age where we're now doing more precision medicine, precision medicine and neurocritical care is going to require us to have real time and integrated information. Um, and this will only come when we uh, can utilize technologies that give us a better understanding of what's going on in real time. And I think this is what's exciting about the potential for big data and for artificial intelligence, because it's through these type of data analytics that we'll be able to grow our understanding and uh, grow our um, ability to individualize and precisely manage each of these patients uh, in the neurocritical care setting. And so I'm gonna go back to my other slide and, and take out ICP and now put in um, advanced neural monitoring, but the reality is, is what type of information do we need? Who optimally should get it, as I mentioned? What are we trying to measure? What type of insult? What type of mechanism? If we have a, um, uh, we're looking to see if the patient has hypoxic, well, we have measures for that and we should be following those in real time to see what that patient is doing and try to avoid uh, any hypoxia. What are some of the other mechanisms that we would want to treat and potentially intervene on? Well, those are technologies that maybe we don't have yet at this point. And so those are the mechanisms that we need to move forward and, and develop in order to bring into the neurocritical care uh, setting. And then lastly, we have to know what we're trying to measure. So um, is it hypoxia? So do they have adequate oxygen or not? That's the outcome measure for that particular technology, for that particular mechanism. So this is the individualized approach to treatment. Here we have a patient who has ICP monitor. Um, we now, in, in present day, we look at whether the ICP is high or low, and then we treat or don't treat that based on high or low. But is, is that alone for ICP sufficient? So are we using all the information from ICP that we could with regards to the management of our patients? And I would argue no. So when it comes to that, we know that there are thresholds and I've gone over these different thresholds um, in adults and children, but now let's consider the possibility that we could get more information from just a simple um, ICP number. So could there be more to the value of pressure other than intracranial pressure? So can we learn more, identify more? And so what we start to understand is that there may be more than just CPP. We may be able to understand the ability to un, uh, know what's going on in an autoregulatory manner, to understand cerebral vas ver, uh, vascular re pressure reactivity. So that index allows us to now start to look at what might be different treatments or what might be, be different interventions that may optimize autoregulation. And so when we look at cerebral autoregulation, it's our normal ability to regulate pressure and blood flow. But the reality is, is that in the injured brain, cerebral autoregulation is distorted or impaired. And in those instances, we may not have the normal in which we think we'll be treating things. As well, we have some hints as to what's going on. And there's been a lot of work over the years as to waveform analysis again, telling us whether the brain is compliant or not, or whether it's swollen or not, it gives us a lot of indication about even if ICP were normal, if we have an abnormal waveform, is this brain impending uh, problematic? Is this gonna be something that's going to cause us issues uh, in the near future? And some of this work has been done, some great work by Ken Brady, looking at cerebral vascular response, and we can see when there's good reactivity, uh, the patients do well. If there's not good reactivity, they don't do well. And in those instances, we can start to begin to understand survival uh, prognosis versus non-survivor. Now, the real question in this 
in this set of numbers is, is this, um, is there, are there interventions that could be developed that we could then better manage these patients and put them in this category and better improve survival? And so some of this work has been uh, um, promulgated over the last few years. Um, the use of uh, several perfusion optimization using PRX, and again, identifying the point at which CPP is optimal in particular patients so that indeed we could start to look at individualizing the care that we give. And so here's just a typical curve uh, from uh, the group in Cambridge. And you can see, again, looking at ways to optimize when the brain is, is um, in a better state and how do we put the patient in that state in a more frequent or more optimal way uh, for a longer period of time in order to try to reduce the extent of injury. And so we know that uh, compliance is an issue. Uh, many of you are familiar with the ICP curve and this is the point of decompensation. So should this be the point at which we intervene before ICP truly starts to jet up and we stu start to get into the points of it dealing with uh, herniation. We truly would like to uh, uh, treat at this point and prevent all of this point here. So many of you are familiar with ICP waveform. And again, I won't uh, belabor this, but here's a normal waveform. We know with the Lundberg waves, which have been around for now 60 years, that indeed, when we start to see different um, aspects of the waveform, we can have different perspectives as to how that brain is doing, what's going on with those secondary mechanisms, how um, swollen is that brain, and how soon will there be impending um, intracranial hypertension issues. And so next time you have an opportunity and you've got a patient with what looks like normal ICP or ICP right on the border of abnormal, take a look at the waveform and, and see if indeed you're starting to see either um, these different curves, uh, Lumberg B or C, indicating that this is a patient that may start to have uh, impending uh, ICP problems and see if indeed this is something that we can try to prevent. And again, I, I won't belabor this, but there are many opportunities here for a potential intervention. And again, what comes first? Is it the value or the waveform? I would argue it's the waveform because there's a lot of autoregulatory um, function going on prior to the issue at which you reach your upper limit of, of, uh, of uh, vasoconstriction versus your lower limit of uh, vasodilation. And so if we bring all of these factors together, now you start to see how complex the potential is just from ICP alone. So just measuring ICP we can learn that much more when doing the analysis of these patients and now starting to understand what's going on with the brain in real time. And so now if we take a, uh, this same parameters, I've already talked to you about high and low, but now if, and, and when to treat or not treat, but now if we now throw another monitor in, so looking at brain oxygenation, this then gives us a whole new complexity of potential um, parameters about what's going on. We then have multiple questions about whether we should treat or not treat. Here's a patient in which there was differences in pathophysiology over a given time. Here was when ICP came down, brain oxygen went up, and they were in um, contradistinction to each other. But then later in the course, this patient changed. So here ICP was high brain oxygen uh, was lower and then came up when we lowered ICP, but then here they became lock and step. So here was what looked like um, uh, cytotoxic edema versus now we're dealing with um, uh, cere uh, diffuse cerebral edema really as a secondary from um, leakage and uh, edema. So again, if we have an individualized approach, we have multiple parameters we can look at. This then gives us even that much more of a complex approach to treatment, uh, to understanding. This then gives us more opportunities for treatment. Um, here's a patient using TCD, 
we could see that the velocities were going up in this particular patient, normal ICP, normal CPP, but clearly something abnormal going on here. This was a patient uh, we took down to angiography, gave intraarterial verapamil, and got now normal velocities. Again, opportunities for understanding about something going on in a patient with post-traumatic uh, vasospasm. And here's just the uh, angiography and then following the uh, treatment uh, with the verapamil. So again, if you measure it, you'll see it. It gives you an opportunity for bringing unique and novel therapeutic interventions for these patients. So again, using my uh, diagram, uh, the reality is, is that this is not just 2D, that this has many opportunities for this to be expanded and to be looked at in many different directions with many different parameters. And that's what I believe is, is what we should be seeing when it comes to complexity of the brain. And then if we throw in uh, one more parameter, a 4D parameter, so if we throw in time, what we're seeing now is that if we look at all of these different parameters in different levels of uh, complexity, whether we look at them in uh, sometimes in hourly, so I mean ICP measured hourly is maybe useful, but if we started to look at ICP in every second and we started to look at it in milliseconds and microseconds, looking at EEG, looking at other things. So in reality is, is we're creating a whole set of parameters that we should be looking at in real time. And what that time uh, uh, sequence is, is really quite variable and, and really quite novel in this area. So the reality is, is that there's multitude of technological advances on the horizon. Um, I think that are very exciting. And I think that in the future, we're going to see that much more uh, with regards to these different parameters. Uh, many of these you're seeing now in order to understand what's going on with the brain and whether it's um, you know, functional imaging um, or uh, neurogenomics or some of these other areas. The reality is, is that our data science has really got the potential for uh, being very exciting in this area. And so I liken this to the matrix. Uh, I think that uh, neurocritical care in the future is, is truly going to be uh, quite exciting. And it really behooves us to really take all of this chaotic information and integrate this. Uh, this is some great work by one of my colleagues, Brian Apavu, really starting to take our everyday parameters, taking what many would consider chaos and confusion, and now uh, integrating all of these into our neural monitoring systems and the ability to get out really useful information that you can use at the bedside in real time in order for us to, to manage these patients. And so I, I think it's a stepwise manner. I don't think you jump right into it. I think that you start introducing the new technologies and how they may integrate uh, with each other. And so going from simple interpretation to complex interpretation, direct treatment, ICP high or low, treat or not treat, simple. But now you start throwing all these other parameters in, now you have potential for much more complex uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. And so it's an iterative process. It's not something I say you can do tomorrow. Bring all the technology together and instant, you've got answers to all these patients. The reality is, is that it's gonna require ongoing knowledge and ongoing understanding of what's going on. And it's going to, really help to guide our uh, laboratory translation or laboratory colleagues who will be able to understand what are these unique mechanisms uh, of the traumatized brain in real time, get us back the technologies that we can bring to the bedside. And so now this is technology that's presently available and you can see very simple parameters, ICP, CPP, PRX calculated, oxygenation, EEG. Now we're looking at spectra of uh, EEG as well. So you really do understand what is out there when it comes to the opportunities for our instant understanding. And so it does require an infrastructure, but it's not one that's not within everyone out there's uh, potential reach. And so I think that the future
is going to involve many, many more parameters. Many of these are already available. Some are on the, the horizon, uh, but I behoove you to uh, do the research, get out there, start utilizing these technologies in your day-to-day uh, -day care. So again, going back to this uh, parameter, uh, excuse me, this diagram, um, I would argue that our, our uh, neuro ICU for the future um, is going to be much larger, much grander, and I think that we then have unlimited potential for developing drugs and other interventions that will uh, help our patients. So I think that the future of neural injury care will be real-time, less or non-invasive, mechanism-dependent, very important, relational, so how do all these different parameters um, integrate together, and then be therapeutic-driven, so being able to give a treatment, know what its response is, and then um, uh, uh, treating it appropriately uh, as, um, as needed for that individual patient. Again, I want to highlight that Traumatic brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability in children. Um, we have a long way to go when it comes to their management, uh, but I think that this is a very exciting time uh, out there. So just to conclude, we know that aggressive early evidence-based protocols as from the, uh, from the guidelines highlight for us the possibility of continuing to improve mortality and further lower morbidity in these patients. There is no question that our therapies, whether it be traumatic brain injury, stroke, ischemia after heart surgery, any of these things, our goal is to avoid second insults and lessen the effects of those secondary injury mechanisms. The future though is going to be in the ability to have real-time information for our ability to understand what are those insults in real time and prevent them from occurring and prevent them from causing further damage and further worsened uh, mechanisms. I think it's a very exciting time for artificial intelligence and for uh, computational data analytics. I think it's going to guide our future when it comes to our treatment algorithms. Uh, I think that this is an exciting time for all of us uh, who are interested in uh, how we can optimize our treatment for our patients. It's not just about clipping the aneurysm. It's not just about taking out the brain tumor. How do we optimize that treatment of that patient, either pre-surgical, during the acute stage after injury, or in the uh, chronic rehabilitative stage uh, to, uh, to better manage these patients? So with that, I thank you um, for being here, for um, uh, soldiering it out out there. I know it's very difficult. And again, we're all with you and, and uh, appreciate your attention today. Thank you very much, Dr. Adelson, outstanding lecture. This was a great opening of the IWBNC. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, Natalia Fernandez is asking, does administrating tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors or other suppressive autoimmune drugs in patients with TBI may minimize secondary mechanisms from occurring? Uh, they may, and that's a great question. So that's a great example of literature that's now available in the preclinical stages, but is not yet translated to uh, clinical work. So um, uh, TNF-alpha and a lot of the different um, um, uh, treatments that may interfere with these secondary mechanisms haven't yet been translated, but those are exciting times. But again, it goes back to, we have to understand what it is we're trying to measure and so can, are we measuring that in, in real time? And are we measuring that um, uh, in patients? So if you were measuring that in patients about, let's say the, um, a mechanism of excitotoxicity, well, if you give that drug, it's, then we have to be able to measure whether it's having a positive impact or not. So should we be using microdialysis in those patients or uh, some other? And we also have to look long-term. So we have to know that TNF-alpha may be very useful in the acute stage, decreasing secondary mechanisms, but in the developing brain, it may have a very negative impact on long-term neuroplasticity. So we have to weigh not just the acute, but what the impact may be long-term. Thank you. Nikat Ahmad asks, sir, 
which outcome score you use in practice? And second question, what are the biomarkers for severity of injury? Another great question. So unfortunately, most of our clinical trials are very based on these global functional outcomes. You know, Glasgow Outcome Score Extended Pediatric is, is our uh, primary outcome measure for traumatic brain injury. Um, it's simple to administer. It could be done as an outpatient. So it could be done over the phone, talking with family, um, with very simple questions. And so it's a wonderful tool to get a global function to know where that child is. But the reality is, is that um, uh, there are many patients who are, would have a, what would be called a good outcome who really are not well independent or not able to dress themselves or not able to learn, um, who are not able to go back to school. So um, that's a, a good mechanism. I mean, a good outcome measure, but it's not really the end all. And so I think we've got to get, um, we've got to develop better outcome measures that really help to tease out what is truly going on with a particular patient at a particular time, and then be able to generalize that to see whether certain treatments or, or algorithms that we used resulted in a good outcome for that patient. I'm sorry, okay. the second part of the question was? What are the biomarkers for severity of TBI? Right, and so right now, um, they're all over the place. And I think that we haven't defined um, really good biomarkers that tell us. We know that, you know, uh, things like, um, you know, GFAP and um, S100B and um, uh, those kinds of things are good biomarkers that tell us, let's say a brain injury has occurred, but the extent of it and how it impacts um, specific patients and is it applicable in severe traumatic brain injury or only in mild injury, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, do you consider tearing of the meningeal artery as primary insult and the epidural hematoma as a secondary insult? I do. So um, again, as I mentioned, when you have the impact and you have the skull fracture that tears the middle meningeal artery, that is considered the primary injury. Now the insult, and I'm sorry, and so that's the primary, so the, the primary impact is the primary mechanism is the impact and then the tearing of the, the meningeal artery is the, is the actual um, in injury itself. So then the hematoma that forms, so now you've got bleeding into the epidural space, that is now the second insult. So that's the secondary insult as a result of that primary um, impact. Okay, thank you. What are the indications of surgery for posterior fossa epidural hematoma in pediatric patients? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so again, um, you have to gauge if the child is um, awake and alert, their Glasgow Coma Score of 1415 and just complaining of a headache, and the hematoma is you know a few millimeters, well, I, don't, I wouldn't rush in to go do anything. Um, I do get follow-up scans. Um, if I'm very worried, as it's, it's an extensive fracture and it's a reasonable size hematoma, well, then I might get a, a, a follow-up image in a, a just a few hours or, or sooner. So, you know, it depends on, on the extent of the hematoma and on the exam. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, the patient is neurologically impaired, you know, severe injury, uh, we don't know the extent of how much the hematoma is causing problems. If they're they're getting a Cushing response, well, then that's obvious. Those are patients, you know, I take immediately to surgery and and uh, evacuate the hematoma, and um, and again in those patients, depending on what they were doing, um, you know, pre-surgical, then you know I I do place monitors to see if they develop the. Uh, uh, secondary mechanisms and secondary injury phase. Okay. Does ICP monitoring translate to increased survival significantly? <laughs> uh, so the answer to that is no. Um, again, um, I think that 
we don't. Um, I'll give a great example. Um, when you get a scan and a patient has a brain tumor, we don't say that that patient has a brain tumor and that's it. And that's all we call, that's all we say. We don't do that. Um, and that's the reality. Traumatic brain injury differs from patient to patient. I do think that ICP monitoring in certain patients does make a difference in their outcome. I don't think there's a question that there are patients that I was surprised had elevated ICP. And then there's patients where I thought they were going to have ICP with like cerebral contusions and didn't have any elevated pressure. So I don't think it's the end all be all. I think that's the reason that we've had so much problems with ICP as being, you know, one or the other. It's not one or the other. It's part of our whole armamentarium. I'll throw another example at you is that there is a parameter that we measure minute to minute and um, we don't even think twice about measuring it and that's pulse. Now, 99% of the time, pulse is not giving you any new information that you don't already know, but yet we still measure and we still put it on the ICU docket. But in those patients where they become bradycardic and it's conjunction with their hypertension, that all of a sudden we recognize that they're starting to herniate. Wow, pulse is very important. I think ICP monitoring is even that much more important because I do think we don't use it enough and we don't look at its complexity enough to understand what's going on in real time and see where we are on that compliance curve to see where we are with regards to the swelling of the brain. And so I think that we could use it uh, that much more but again, that's further research. And for those of you uh, out there, I would, I would argue that take a look at the waveform. Don't just use ICP value, but start to look at what's going on with the, with the brain in and of itself in real time. Great. Natalia Londoño asks, Dr. Adelson, I suppose it all depends on the primary injury. But, but is there an average or mean window of time to intervene in order to prevent the escalate of two secondary mechanisms and furthermore to secondary injuries? Well, you know, those secondary mechanisms come on at different times. So you're absolutely right. Um, there isn't a lot you can do about excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity happens right at the time of the impact. So when you have the primary impact, the brain's response is a very high spike in uh, glutamate, for example, um, uh, um, uh, out there into the uh, extracellular milieu. And in those instances, there, that's milliseconds. So there's not a way to prevent that. Now, having said that, after you get that decline, after the brain now goes into the secondary injury phase, uh, glutamate levels come down, but then they start to rise again over the next 24 to 96 hours. So it may be that you could potentially intervene to those secondary mechanisms in the uh, subacute phase for those patients. So again, you have to define what are the mechanisms that are injurious and then develop the ways to measure them in the clinical setting and then identify interventions, then identify whether those interventions indeed help to stop those mechanisms in the acute phase and that they also have good outcomes in the chronic phase. So it's not just simple, identify a mechanism and treat it. It's an iterative process. It requires a lot of study, but I would argue we need to put the millions and billions of dollars that we put into brain cancer for children and put that into traumatic brain injury and other right. types of brain injury. Okay. What are the indications for a seizure prophylaxis in pediatric TBI? Uh, great question. So I do seizure prophylaxis. I use Keppra or Levisoteracetam. Uh, <laughs> Keppra was easier, sorry. Uh, Levisoteracetam um, in order to prevent seizures from occurring. I do it in every severe traumatic brain injury patient. I do it because the, the risk of potential for that drug is very, very low. And, but the benefit is there because if you have a secondary mechanism, you have seizures, 
that leads to worsened secondary mechanisms that where it leads to worsened secondary um, injury. So I treat uh, for the first 10 to 14 days with anti-epileptic medication in all my severely injured patients. I would argue that we should use it in any patient that's had a severe injury, whether it's stroke or uh, ischemia from cardiac surgery or any of those patients. And the reason being is that the risk profile for that drug is, is low. I think the benefit is absolutely there. If they have a seizure, they go downhill. Um, it's, that is absolutely seen. Great. Many of the times we don't measure EEG on all patients. And so I do it prophylactically. If you have EEG, you could theoretically just treat if you saw seizures. Okay. Sebastian Vasquez asks, what is your opinion and experience with cerebral microdialysis and brain tissue oxygen pressure in pediatric neurocritical care? Um, I don't use microdialysis. I have used it in the past. It's very, very complex. And again, it goes to my slide about it's out there and it can be utilized, but it's, it is a very complex system and it's very difficult to use. Brain oxygen, I use in all my severe traumatic brain injury patients. Um, there is no question that ICP could be normal, but your brain oxygen low, and then we treat based on brain oxygen uh, need. So I, again, I, um, I um, really recommend going to the guidelines, looking at that first tier therapy, but if you have the opportunity, I use at a minimum uh, NEARS, so near infrared spectroscopy, but I also use uh, an intraparenchymal brain oxygen monitor when indicated. Great. And the last question, um, in which cases do you use methylprednisolone pulses? I never use methylprednisolone. That is a drug that has already been proven multiple times not to be effective in traumatic brain injury, so we don't use it in traumatic brain injury. Um, I will make a caveat to that because we also recognize that a lot of children, a lot of adults as well, have neuroendocrine dysfunction in the acute phase, particularly with frontal contusions, frontal injury, they can have hypothalamic pituitary damage. Uh, we do measure their uh, cortisol level and we will give um, uh, hydrocortisone in support of patients who have low cortisol levels. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Allison. On behalf of CN, I would like to thank you again. This has been a remarkable lecture. We're really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2020 IWBNC. More than 460 people were connected to your conference for over 100 countries. Well, You're more than welcome. Well, you. uh, <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay tuned to watch more lectures from other speakers. Uh, we have in, another, in the other room, we have Dr. Schwartz doing his lecture, Long-Term Outcome After Endonasal Surgery for Supracellular Meningiomas and Craniopharyngiomas. So people from the audience who want, who want to get to that conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the agenda on our website, cianos.com. Dr. Allenson, it's been a pleasure. A true pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.